God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on our way, thou who by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in thy path, we pray. As we gather here to study your word, Lord, we offer praise to God our Father, who sent his Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. We rejoice in knowing he has risen, and we have a new life in our resurrected Savior. We thank you for paying the debt of our sins. Now, Lord, give us ears to hear your truth of how we have been freed by Jesus Christ from death, hell, sin, and the grave. Our hearts are lifted because of this freedom we now possess through you. Continue to awaken our hearts by your spirit as we live in this world to make a difference in the lives of those we meet as we fulfill the mandate of the Great Commission. May our attitude, words, and action reflect your truth so we can bear witness of your redeeming love in Christ Jesus. May the world be illuminated by the light of your word shining through each of us. We ask that you now continue to bless Dr. Crutchfield as he brings these lessons for us each week. In Jesus' most holy righteous name we pray. Amen. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version Bible, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 31 through 38. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me, because there is no place in you for my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. May the God give his blessings to the believers of his holy word. Amen. Greetings. April 24th, uh, our last uh, Sunday of this unit of the last Sunday of April, uh, Experiencing Liberation, John 8, 131 through 38. Many people are bound by bad habits and bad vices. How can one experience deliverance? Jesus is the truth that sets us free and enables us to be his disciples. Uh, the goal is for the lesson to consider the double meaning of slavery and freedom in Jesus' conversation with believing Jews. To ponder the many ways people are enslaved in current society. To live in the freedom that Jesus gives to those who follow him. In verses 31 through 32 of this 8th chapter, Jesus offers discipleship and freedom to those believing in him. Jesus said to those, those Jews who believed him, the previous verse tells us that many believed in John 8.30. Now Jesus spoke to those who had the beginning of the belief, telling them that they needed to continue in belief. This section of this course is addressed to those who believe and yet do not believe. Clearly, they were inclined to think that what Jesus said was true, but they were not prepared to yield him the far-reaching allegiance that real trust in him implies this is a most dangerous spiritual state. I love that, this understanding. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If we will be Jesus' disciples, we must abide in his word. There's no other way to be a follower of Jesus. The word made flesh is to abide, to live in, to dwell in, to make your home in his word. If you abide in my word, the to those who have just been described as believing on Jesus, 
went on to say, if you emphasize the distinction from those who had not believed, abide in my word, not content with making the first step towards faith and obedience, then, but not till then, are you really my disciples? Uh, what it means to abide in his word, some commentators will help us say it, is welcoming it, being at home with it, living with it, so continuously that it becomes part of the believer's life a permanent influence and stimulus in every fresh advance in goodness and holiness. This too is another statement reflecting the unity between the Father and the Son. Jesus called people to abide in his word. In the mouth of anyone other than Jesus, these words would be observed. Our treatment of God's words discriminate, uh, uh, discriminates us or, or, or differentiates us from other people. He that has commandments and keeps them is he or she that loves me. You shall, not, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is the result of abiding in the word of Jesus. We prove ourselves to be his disciples, and we know the truth, and God works his freedom in our life through his truth. The freedom Jesus spoke of doesn't come from just an academic pursuit of truth in general, but from abiding in his word and being his disciple. There's nothing like the freedom we can have in Jesus. No money can buy it. No status can attain it. No works can earn it. And nothing can match it. It is tragic that not every Christian experiences this freedom, which can never be found except by abiding in God's word and being Jesus' disciples. Verses 33 through 36. Jesus answers their protest that they are already free. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. The reaction of the religious leaders wasn't that that's wonderful. Tell us more about what it means to be free by trusting in your word. Instead, they reacted, we don't need this. We're good. This was a remarkable and unthinking statement. The Jewish people had been in bondage under Egypt and the Philistines, under Babylon, Persia, Syria, and Rome. Was there not a Roman garrison looking down from the castle into their very temple courts where this boastful falsehood was uttered? Yet many Jewish people of the time had a strong sense of their own independence. Oh, this sounds so familiar. Josephus writes of, of the followers of Judas in Galilee who led a famous revolt against the Romans. They have an inviolable, inviolable attachment to liberty. And they say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. The power of this self-deception is an unconverted person is infinite. Whoever commits sin is, a sin is a slave of sin. Sin in this passage is a verb tense indicating a habitual, continual action. The person in habitual sin is a slave to sin. The participle uh, construction of uh, everyone who sins is in the present tense, which implies a continual habit of sinning rather than an occasional lapse. There's another kind of slavery that, that, that new social or economic slavery that we often think of. Sin is a slave master. And it is possible even for people who think of themselves as free to be enslaved, uh, uh, to be enslaved in sin. We should not minimize the force of, of bond servant. It does not mean a person who is paid wages and who has a considerable area of freedom. It means a slave. A slave does not abide in a house forever, but a son abides forever. Slavery to sin is the worst kind of slavery because there's no escape from ourself. A son must set us free, and the Son of God sets us free and brings us into the household of God. The slave has no permanent footing in the house. He or she may be dismissed or sold. The son makes you free. You shall be free indeed. If we are set free from our slavery to sin, set free by our Son, and set free by abiding in Jesus' word and being his disciple, then we are free indeed, having a true freedom that contrasts to the freedom that the Pharisees blindly claim. The Son makes you free, so the slave of sin cannot by himself change his status. He cannot convert himself, nor can he be converted by any fellow slave. The liberator from our bondage must come from outside the ranks of the enslaved humanity. And this is how we experience liberation. If we are slaves of sin, 
that we may be transferred from his household and brought into the true home of our Father's house. Here then is the blessed hope for us all. And then in verses 37 through 41, they prove themselves to be unlike the father, their father, Abraham. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Jesus would admit that they are Abraham's descendants in a genetic sense. But Abraham was not their father in a spiritual sense. When messengers from heaven came to Abraham, he received them. Uh, but these genetic descendants of Abraham rejected and sought to kill the one who was sent from heaven. To cherish murderous intentions against someone who has imparted the truth of God to them is not the mark of the children of Abraham. Because my word has no place in you. Their rejection of the word of Jesus and Jesus the word proved they were not like Abraham. They uh, did not have the freedom that comes from abiding in his word. Charles Spurgeon considered several ways that God's word should have a place in the believer. The word of God ought to have an inward place. The word of God ought to have a place of high honor. The word of God ought to have a place of trust. The word of God ought to have a place of rule. The word of God is to have a place of love. The word of God ought to have a permanent place. I speak what I have seen with my father. Jesus reminded them that what he did was consistent with his father and what they did was consistent with their father. You do what you have seen with your father. Jesus would soon and clearly tell them what their, who their father was. Abraham is our father. The religious leaders protested that Abraham was their true father. This was true in genetic sense, but not in the spiritual sense. Jesus agreed they were descendants of Abraham, but not children of Abraham because they sought to kill Jesus when, when Abraham embraced him. They were doing the deeds of their father. Jesus exposed the inconsistency in their life. They said they were children of Abraham, but didn't act like it at all. If their origin could be wholly traced to, to Abraham, then their conduct would resemble Abraham's. Uh, Jesus' point was important. Our spiritual parentage is what determines our nature and our destiny. If we are born again and have God as our Father, it will show in our nature and in our destiny. But if our Father is Satan or Adam, it will also show in our nature and our destiny. Just as it shows that those adversaries of Jesus. To keep my word is to continue in my word. And that is how we experience liberation. It is not only outward obedience, but the in endurance inside and the obedience of faith. Keep God's word. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's our lesson for today. Blessings to you. I give to you the challenges on the next slide. Blessings.